three, two, one, go. Okay, so I'm doing this because someone else didn't. Um, let me just stick to the subject and not get distracted by that. So this one is the Indian laurel fig, the Chinese banyan. Uh, its its proper name is Ficus microcarpa. Just a little note that I was typing in macrocarpa and then not getting any results. So um, especially when you're using the botanical name, having it correct uh, makes a big difference. So microcarpa, right, meaning small carpal, yeah. Um, so I didn't find a huge amount of information on this. Um, I did go to the um, Cal Poly, which I think is Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, their select tree, which was actually a really fantastic website. I put it in the resources. Uh, and they really, they tell me how to distinguish from a different ficus. Um, something to know about ficuses, the, um, that family, is that they have a milky sap. So that's something that distinguishes them too. Um, and often have these um, kind of buttress roots, sort of like a tropical uh, uh, characteristic. Um, so not just like the trunk and then the roots underground, but like like prop roots. That's not actually botanically what they are, but um, that that buttress I think is actually what they're called. So they um, they help support the plant. They come out all around the base and and make like a, great for climbing, great for kids. They can crawl around on the roots that are sort of growing all over there, around the base of the plant. Um, so what's cool about this one is it can be quite a substantial tree, like very wide also, like 40 foot wide tree, that's big. Um, and I mentioned that they have like, like sweeping branches, so probably quite lovely too, that they are evergreen, um, not like a conifer, but uh, they don't lose their leaves and they continually produce new leaves, which is also kind of a tropical habit. Um, what else? Oh, the fruit is really dry, so uh, it's not something you would eat. It's, it's a ficus, which is a fig family, but the edible figs are, are a different branch of that family. Um, I think I was being silly here. I'm like, unless you're a monkey, because monkeys eat their dried fruit of these kind of ficuses all the time, but we would not want to do that. They did mention um, litter being an issue with leaves and the dried fruits falling and stuff like that. Um, the fact that these are popular for bonsai is kind of a surprise because they're giant trees, so they get bonsai into tiny little things, but also it mentioned that it can make a lovely hedge too, and they can be kept um, sheared to about five, five feet. Now, keep in mind how much maintenance that requires, because if you are, were a landscape person and you were recommending this to somebody who was going to either like do it themselves or didn't want to pay somebody to take care of that ficus hedge that's supposed to be five feet high, soon it would be like 30 feet tall, and that would probably be kind of bad. So just to keep in mind how big the overall growth is likely to be um, when maintenance is required. Native to the Malay Peninsula, I'm thinking that's like Malaysia, that tells you my geography skills, um, to Borneo. So again, like very tropical. Um, they mentioned that when grown in California, thrips, which is the singular, it's kind of a weird name for this awful pest, can be a problem. Um, Let's see, where's some pictures of our ficus microcarpa, the Indian laurel fig. So you see that big trunk and you see the roots come out right there. That's what I was talking about. Multi-branching, um, really great shade. There's some leaves. If you were to snap one of those leaves off, it would have that milky sap inside. And there's one against a fence, um, a wall rather. And uh, anyway, it's a really pretty looking tree. Okay. Next is ginkgo, and I love ginkgo. I was happy. I was like, this is how nutty I am. I have way too much to do right now. And when I knew that I had to do these, I was like, oh, crap. And then I was like, oh, but look at it. It's ginkgo and jacaranda. I love those. Anyway, here we go with ginkgo. I think I've spelled that wrong about three out of five times. I put the K in before the G, but ginkgo, the maidenhair tree. So, I mean, just the story of this, which I shared a little bit in the modules, um, when we were talking about the um, gymnosperms, is that it was thought to be extinct, um, but it was actually being kept alive in remote monasteries. I don't know if it was either Japan or China or maybe both, but um, the, uh, the monks there had been continuing to grow these trees for centuries. It's a kind of wonderful and lovely thing. And they're very, very beautiful trees. And then when the horticulture industry got hold of them, now they're like everywhere. Um, so they're still in danger of extinction in the wild, um, wild population, wild, I mean, wild, cultivated by monks, but relatively wild, um, but not, certainly not in this country, they're not extinct. Uh, another thing about this tree, sort of like what I mentioned about the, um, the banyan, is that people, like I've got three in the backyard, in a tiny little spot, they were here when we moved in, people have a tendency to plant these 
and they're lovely when they're young, you know, they grow fairly slowly. But at some point, these trees are going to be 50 to 80 feet tall and between 30 and 40 feet. The ones in my backyard are planted like 10 feet apart. This is not, it makes no sense. So just be cautious, especially if you are a landscaper or someone and you're recommending these plants, you've got to think about how, what its mature size is going to be, or you set people up for kind of a, a difficult uh, decision-making process later. Um, so even though it might look a little weird when you plant it and it's this tiny little thing, um, you know, keep in mind what the mature size is going to be. You don't want to be putting in plants that are going to overgrow their space in 10 years. You want a garden that's going to last, right? I hope you do anyway. So the leaves are alternate, but I don't think that's what people use to identify it. It's really that fan-shaped leaf that's so distinct. Like I say, its shape is very distinct. And it usually has some little incisions on the leaf. I think I'll find the picture of the leaf right there. Yeah, see, the, so it's got those little incisions, that beautiful fan shape, and they have these little, like a little spur, and it has like three to five leaves per spur. Um, it, it's, uh, it's deciduous, it loses its leaves in the wintertime and often a beautiful shape. You can kind of get an idea of the shape of that trunk there. And there's not a lot of trees, certainly not native trees around here that do that. Um, so it's kind of nice, especially if you're lonesome for the east and all the fall color, it gives you a little bit of that. Um, stem is light brown, ages to gray and black, blackish on older growth. Although if you look at this, that trunk looks really, really dark. I don't know what that one's about. Um, indeed, it, it's, it's very, very tolerant of urban spaces. So the pollution, which sometimes is a real issue for other trees, is not a problem for ginkgo, which means they get planted around a lot. Um, they get to be sexually mature, which sounds odd when we're talking about a tree, but it's real. Um, around like 20, I think, either 10, it was, I don't remember, it was 10 or 20. I don't remember which one. But either way, it's a long time. Like you could have a tiny little one of these trees in your yard and only realize that it was female a little bit later on. And the problem with the females, and I, I get tempted to say fruit, but that's not correct because fruit doesn't exist in the gymnosperms. The uh, fleshy covering of the seed, it sounds just silly, but you know, in all, all regular terminology, we just call it fruit, but it's not really, uh, is really smelly. Like, I don't know, like the, the, the chemicals are the same kind of things that are in like rancid butter and like just funky stuff. It's got a horrible smell. So if you have this, you want to go out of your way. Um, if you are thinking of growing this, go out of your way to make sure to find a male plant. And I know, I think there are ways that they do that now. Um, or else just, you know, spend the extra money and get a big one that already has expressed its male catkins, which are kind of cool looking. The ones that we have have these longish um, little tufts of flowers. Um, it's called a catkin with the male flowers there. Um, and then it's a male and then you don't have that problem maybe some pollen issues, but not a other big deal. So again, very tolerant of heat. Um, it tolerates salt, not an issue for me, but if you're closer to the coast and it grows in full sun, so it's pretty cool. I mean, it's a really beautiful tree. Let's see, 20 years, 20 years, there we go. Um, yeah, so I showed these pictures before, and then I think I found one with the female, um, this female tree. There's the fruit. Um, the fleshy covered seeds there. There's the ginkgo for you. And also, you know, the medicinal properties of ginkgo too. I haven't seen a lot of specific evidence about whether or not it's real, but certainly it's uh, purported to be great for memory. Uh, I think probably other things too. Okay, moving right along to the jacaranda. Um, so the jacaranda, oh, I forgot to mention that the ginkgo is in the ginkgo ACE and the ginkgo ales. And that ficus is in the um, Moraceae, the fig family, and it's in the Rosales um, of the Eudicots. Uh, the Bignoniaceae, which is a tropical tree family, and its bigger uh, order is the Lamiales, which includes the mints. I always notice that because I, I know that the mints are the Lamiaceae. Um, so Jacaranda mimosifolia, mimosifolia. Um, so clearly it's referencing the leaves, folia. Oh, it looks like a mimosa, maybe. Mimosa tree. Um, so the ferny pinnate leaf, so it's pinnate like a um, feather, right? Long um, instead of like palmate, like a hand. Um, pinnately compound leaves, so they're divided, and we'll see a picture of those in just a minute. Flowers in mid spring, um, mid to late spring, or any time in the summer. And the flowers are spectacular. I mean, if you have a jacaranda tree, 
you're either like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Or you're like, yeah, get it. Let's throw those flower petals all over my car. Um, I'm more on the like, it's so beautiful because I haven't ever had to pay for the new paint job because the, um, I think it's like insect frass, partly that happens, but I think the trees sometimes also exude stuff and that stuff can apparently peel the paint off your car. So lavender blue tubular, two inches long and in eight inch long clusters. Apparently they have a white variety too. And then the fruit, um, this actually is fruit because it's an angiosperm. So it's like a little clam, like a little woody clamshell. It's kind of what it looks like. And then there's a picture of that that I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, mentioned the mess. Indeed, um, a big tree has been me being really botanically accurate. It can be multi-trunked. There should be a hyphen in there, sorry. Um, and shrubby. Um, or else quite a substantial tree, 50, 30 to 40 feet tall, 15 to 30 feet wide, um, big deciduous, it drops everything, seasonal uh, color when in bloom, it comes from Brazil. Uh, it's a great pollinator tree. And then here we go. Look at that. I mean, that's beautiful. So it looks like it gets its, um, its flowers before it leaves out. So it must do that first, which is a strategy to help with pollination. Kind of cool. Here's some of the flowers. Um, so those are big noni ACE flowers. If you've ever seen mint flowers, they look like this, but they're really small, kind of like that anyway. They're related. Um, there we got some flowers and then those ferny compound leaves. So like this would be a leaf, right? Somewhere it's, it reaches the branch and then it's divided multiple times there. Um, kind of ferny like, and there's the clam, clammy looking, uh, clamshell looking fruit that's, I don't know, it's like, like about that big. It's pretty big and very woody and hard. Anyway, so there's the trees for uh, week one, a little late, but better late than never. And um, thank you to everyone who does these and does them on time to help us all learn these plants because this is how we're going to learn the plants. Anyway, over and out.